Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one. Welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles. Once again, we've got two battles for you today because it's unusual to see a World of Tanks battle these days that lasts longer than seven or eight minutes. Uh, and that's true of these two as well. Our first battle, starring 66 Piotr... You know, his name's not that hard to pronounce. But we're going to call him Dave anyway. <laughs> it's been a while since we saw Dave. Welcome back. Always good to see you. Uh, Dave here in the Soviet Tier 8 Premium Heavy Tank, the KV-5. Do you know how many Premium Soviet Heavy Tanks there are in this game at the moment? There's at least 26. And that's just the heavies. You know, never mind the lights, the mediums, the tank destroyers, the artillery, just the Premium Soviet Heavy Tanks. There are almost more of these in the game than there are Swedish tanks entirely. And I think, although I could be wrong, because it might have been the lend churchill at Tier 5, but I think the KV-5 might have been the first. This tank has been around a very long time. It's propelled by the purest Soviet bullshit. This is a 100-ton tank that can do 40 kilometers per hour. It says 40 kilometers per hour is its speed limit. That's bullshit as well. If you get this thing rolling down a hill, it will easily do 50. And with 100 tons of weight and some extremely thick armour, you do not want to get rammed by one of these things. It used to have a huge weak spot. Can't see it from here, but what was known as the R2-D2, the machine gun turret at the front, was a massive and easily penetrated weak spot. But in the same way that the rangefinder ears on the turret of the T-29 uh, were buffed, in that they were basically removed from the T-29's turret hitbox entirely, which, let's be honest, the T-29 really kind of needed, because the T-29, as we know it now, is an incredibly good hold-down Tier 7 heavy tank. You get the hold down behind cover, you poke the turret over with its great gun depression, you're basically bulletproof from the front, but that never used to be the case, because those rangefinders were part of the tank's hitbox, and they were basically unarmoured, so that effectively made the T-29 useless. Well, they buffed it by effectively removing those rangefinders from the tank's hitbox, which turned the T-29 into the hold down god that we know today. The KV-5, they didn't do something quite as extreme. The machine gun turret that you could just see there at the front, it's still part of the tank's hitbox, but they did massively buff its armor. And because it's perfectly cylindrical, Unless you strike it straight on, your shots are likely to ricochet. Which means that the KV-5 went from being a very well-armoured tank, but which was extremely vulnerable to anybody who actually knew what they're doing, to, well, a very well-armoured tank. All things are relative, of course. I mean, it's well-armoured, but not if you've got Tier 9 shooting at you. But because it has preferential matchmaking, it will never see Tier 10s. Which is nice. Well, Dave's made it into the enemy cap circle. Unfortunately, his team are getting slaughtered. They are four kills behind, and a subs they are five kills behind. <laughs> and the enemy team have a massive hit point advantage. The gun on the KV-5 can best be described as adequate. It's a 107 millimeter, um, but it has less than 200 millimeter penetration with regular ammo. And I think it only gets something like 219 millimeters with the gold APCR. It's it, something like that. It's definitely less than 220, which is, um, it's not great. I mean, it used to be when this tank was introduced a very long time ago, but well, power creep is a thing. Less than 220 millimeters of penetration at tier eight, even with gold is actually pretty bad these days. Team is still five kills behind. It's customary at this point in proceedings for me to say something like, and things are going to get a lot worse before they get any better. They're not going to get any better. <laughs> they are, in fact, going to get a lot worse. So what's the point in today's video, Jingles? Well, at least this first battle in today's video, I'm going to take control of the camera from here on in, because you need to have a proper view in order to witness what's going to happen here is the VK over there is uh, 
I think he's just given up. I mean, he's clearly getting hit, but he's just not moving. It's not like he had his track. Yeah, he's just given up. Dave, however, is made of sterner stuff. The team are now eight kills behind. <laughs> Look at the battering he's taken. <laughs> because while the game has moved on substantially since the KV-5 was introduced, it's still a bit of a beast, especially when it's top tier. The thing that amuses me about this particular battle, and it's not just the colossal battering that Dave's weathering here, it's the fact that it's not like nobody's ever seen a KV-5 before. It's one of the oldest premiums in the game. And we are in a tier 8 battle. I mean, you could kind of understand this if it was a tier 4 battle, because you can get to tier 4 on the first day that you start playing World of Tanks, so not having a clue is completely understandable at tier 4. At tier 8, not so much. And yet, despite the fact that this tank is basically... I mean, it is thickly armoured, but there's effectively zero sloping or angling going on. It's just a hundred tons of monolithic slabs of metal but nobody seems to have the faintest idea of where or how to shoot at it. He's now bounced more than 7,000 damage. And people are just... He took an entire clip of gold ammo from the T-69 over there. <laughs> because of course he did. It's a T-69. <laughs> Um, I think he's probably realised he's not going to win by capping. Uh, he's also probably realised he's not going to live. But he's refusing to quit. But, well, yeah, there he goes. Oh, breaking news. I've just been told we now have some footage of at least one of the enemy players who was shooting at Dave during the course of today's battle. And here it is. Yep, yeah, there you go. Roll that face all over the keyboard. Hammer the two key. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that seems fairly accurate. <laughs> I feel kind of bad for this uh, ST1. He's actually had a pretty good game, but there's no way he's carrying this one. The hilarious thing is, they almost pulled it off. At one point, when Dave was in that cap circle, they were 10 seconds away from winning. And then I can only assume that somebody on the enemy team held their breath for long enough for an actual thought to coalesce in their head and shot at somebody other than Dave, resetting the cap. And, of course, the ELC suicides at the end of the match. The perfect ending to a perfect battle. No steel wall medal, unfortunately, because you have to survive in order to qualify for that, and, well, he obviously didn't. But he did get the cool-headed award, uh, mostly thanks to the enemy team doing this, which allowed him to survive at least, and I suspect it was substantially more, 10 ricochets or non-penetrating hits in a row, doing more than 3,700 damage of his own. And while the amount of damage blocked by his armour wasn't quite over 9,000, he was only 120 points away. Because of the 65 hits that he took during that battle, only 7 penetrated, blocking 8,820 damage. Oh well, maybe next time. But before that, this. This is Flamethrower in the Astron Rex. It's a tier 8 standard battle here on the El Halouf map. I haven't actually seen this map in a while. The Astron Rex is a relatively new tier 8 premium US medium tank. It's a funny looking thing. I mean, that's a really awkward looking muzzle brake at the end of this 105mm gun, which you've probably noticed is an autoloader. Yes, a 105mm autoloader on a tier 8 medium no less. Mmm, pretty spicy. More on that later. Um, I hesitate to call this a bullshit tank. I mean, it was in development as part of the Astron project, which was a US Army project intended to develop tanks for fighting on an atomic battlefield. It never went anywhere. It was never built. But what we have here in game is a very small and pretty fast medium tank armed with a 105mm 5-shot autoloader. This is both a very good and a very bad thing. I'm not going to bother talking about the other characteristics of the tank because it's basically all about the gun. The World of Tanks wiki entry for this 
attack says that it has amazing burst damage. 1600 damage if all shots penetrate. And while that's technically true, I don't think it really qualifies as burst damage. As we're going to see, the duration between each subsequent shot from this autoloader. It's pretty bad. Most other autoloaders would be able to land two shots at each of these enemy tanks who are just lining up one at a time. <laughs> That's three now. In order to cross that stretch of open ground, here comes a fourth. I mean, he's basically able to get one shot off, and that's it. So, calling it burst damage is kind of stretching it a bit. Plus, it has a 30 second reload, which is pretty bad. But then again, it is a 105mm gun, and an auto-loading 105mm gun no less on a tier 8 medium. And that is pretty spicy, so I suppose there do have to be some drawbacks. And the intra-clip reload and the 30 second drum reload are not the only drawbacks associated with this gun, because it also only carries 30 rounds of ammunition into battle. The Batchat 25T is probably the poster child for medium tanks going into battle with limited ammo capacity, and that gets six more shots than the Astron Rex. And while it has a pretty decent aiming time of two seconds, it has horrible accuracy, 0.43 dispersion, and subpar penetration. This is another one of those tanks that does kind of encourage you, a lot like the T69, to roll your face all over the two key, because it only gets 190 millimeters of penetration with standard ammo, and 250 with gold. Right now, he's got all five shots reloaded. If there are any children watching, turn your face away right now, because he's about to indulge in a spot of surprise, but sex. And he reload before the 112 lumbers its turret around? Yes, but only just. Two shots remaining. 30 second reload, or use those two shots? Well, I suppose it kind of depends on what kind of opposition there is. The enemy team are getting spanked, by the way. Seven kills to three. He's going for the KV-3. This is a one-shot kill if it can penetrate, and it does. KV-3, unsurprisingly, was loading the gold. The KV-3's 122mm gun is... It's not quite a derp gun, but it only has 175mm of penetration. And while the hull armour on this thing is nothing special, it does have a pretty bouncy turret, 220mm. Although that massive and very typically American Commander's Cupola slash machine gun turret on the top is a huge weak spot. But why aim for weak spots when you can just roll your face all over the two key? In a rare example of somebody else on the team being capable of thinking and breathing at the same time, the Cheri is tossing out Battlefield Platoon invitations. There's a Brothers in Arms up for grabs here. Of course, to get a Brothers in Arms you have to be in a platoon where every member of the platoon gets at least three kills and survives. So invitations are being strung out to the likely candidates, including of course Flamethrower himself, but also the Scorpion on the team because there have to be three members of the platoon, each with three kills apiece, each surviving. And I think the Scorpion is about to accept. There it is. Right. So we're now playing for a Brothers in Arms. Now, Flamethrower has earned a Brothers in Arms before. Minor spoiler alert. He ain't going to be earning one today. Oh, there's the 4202. Also armed with a 105mm gun. Not, however, an autoloader. Although it does have a fairly fast reload. In fact, it's not that much slower than the intra-clip reload on the Astron Rex. He's rolling his face all over his two key, of course, because of course he is. I mean, why would, why would you need less than 250mm of penetration in Tier 8 battle? Notice that Flamethrower held his fire until he could be absolutely sure, because he would need it, that every single one of these shots was going to penetrate. He's nailed the FB4202, follows it up by blowing away the Super Hellcat, just leaving the Scorpion on the enemy team, who unfortunately did just nail the friendly Scorpion that they were platooned up with, so no brothers in arms, he's too far away for Flamethrower to get the kill, so no Top Gun. However, Flamethrower has been playing World of Tanks for more than 10 years. In that time, he's earned the Brothers in Arms award before, he's earned the Top Gun award before. But this is the first time in 10 years of playing this game that he's earned a crucial contribution, which you get when the members of your platoon between them, and they don't have to survive to qualify, 
score 12 or more kills. Which, when you consider there's only 15 tanks on the enemy team, that's kind of special. Oh, and there's a high caliber in there as well for doing 45 points short of 4,000 damage. But not at all what Flamethrower was getting excited about. That was his first ever Crucial Contribution Award in more than 10 years of playing World of Tanks. It turns out persistence does pay off. <laughs> and <laughs> that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed today's battles. And as always, take care. And I'll catch you next time.